Welcome to CSEC Physics with me, Marvin Lee. <laughs> Welcome to CSEC Physics. In today's lesson, we will look at units, mass, weight, and density. We will attempt to define and explain and even give reasons for the existence of some of these quantities and systems. Let's start with units. Now, why are units necessary? Units are necessary for communication. So we could all basically speak the same language in, in terms of science. So, simple example that shows this point. Let us assume that in country A, this, this is one unit of mass. And in country B, this is one unit of mass. If someone was traveling from country A to country B, you can clearly see that there will be some serious issues if you are purchasing, buying, or even selling based on your idea of mass. If you're from country A, going to country B, serious issues. So over time, since the world has become smaller and smaller, um, globalization, ease of travel have all made us more a global village than distant countries, we have come to need a system that basically allows us to speak the same language when it comes to things like mass, length, time, temperature, and so on, especially for business and science. So the SI system or international system of units was developed and there are seven basic or fundamental quantities, seven of them. There is mass, there is length, there is time, temperature, electric current, amount of substance, and luminous intensity. However, for CSEC physics, we only look at the first five. Now, let us look at the five quantities, their units, and their symbols. First of all, we have mass. Mass is measured in kilograms, and the symbol for the kilogram is kg. Length, the unit of length is the meter, and the symbol is m. For time, it is the second, symbol S. For thermodynamic temperature, the unit is Kelvin, and the symbol is K. And finally, electric current, the unit is the ampere, and the symbol is capital A. These are the five fundamental quantities that we use for CSEC physics. Now, we will look at mass. Mass. Here we have three different masses. Big mass, medium-sized mass, and little mass. Now, mass is simply a measure of the amount of substance an object contains. This object has a greater mass than this, because this contains a whole lot more substance than this. Now, mass should be measured in kilograms, but we Guyanese have a tendency to stick to pounds. But for correctness sake, mass has to be measured in a scientific setting in kilograms. My mass in kilograms is around 105, yes? A whole 105 kilograms. That means I contain 105 kilograms of substance. So mass is a measure of the amount of substance an object, body, thing contains. Now, weight. Weight and mass are often interchanged in a Guyanese setting, but they are not the same. Weight is not mass, and mass is definitely not weight. Mass is the amount of substance an object contains, but weight is the downward force exerted by gravity on mass. Okay, so when you go to the market um, and you hear someone say, weigh this for me, or what is the weight of this, or how many pounds of plantain, or what is the weight of this plantain, they're actually referring to mass. Weight is a force measured in Newtons, and weight is influenced by something called acceleration due to gravity. Now, acceleration due to gravity is simply the rate at which an object accelerates as it falls freely under the influence of gravity. Hence, acceleration due to gravity. As we can see in our little formula here, weight is mass in kilograms by acceleration due to gravity in meters per second squared. Once again, weight is mass in kilograms by acceleration due to gravity in meters per second squared. An interesting thing about weight is that since weight is influenced by acceleration due to gravity, 
different planetary objects bodies will produce different weights now planets are not all the same size as we all know we are larger than the moon jupiter is many times larger than we are these objects because of the difference in the amount of mass they possess will produce different gravitational pulls or forces causing different accelerations due to gravity now here on Earth, our acceleration due to gravity is around 9.8 meters per second squared. On the moon, it is significantly less. That is why whenever you see footage of men walking on the moon, they appear to be light and floaty. That's because there's a weaker gravitational pull on the moon than there is on the Earth. If we went to a larger planetary body, a body significantly larger than Earth, that body would produce a much larger acceleration due to gravity that acceleration due to gravity would cause objects even you and i to have a much greater weight and in some cases the gravity could be so great or the acceleration due to gravity could be so great that the weight produced would make even walking a tad impossible so be grateful you're on planet earth because our acceleration due to gravity is just right now we move on to density and density is an important property of substances and it has certain applications in certain fields of science and engineering this is a 200 gram mass it's just 200 grams now this mass occupies a given space if we divided the mass of this very small object by the space it occupied we would get its density mass divided by volume gives density now, density is measured in either kilograms per meter cubed for very large objects, or it is measured in grams per cm cubed for small objects, like this one. Now, larger objects, solid objects, would have a definite density that we can easily measure in kilograms per meter cubed. But tiny objects like this, coins, um, small pieces of jewelry, even probably concrete blocks. You can measure their mass in grams per cm cube, but large objects, very large objects, we use kilograms per meter cubed. Now, having looked at density, we must now look at relative density. And as we can see from our little equation, relative density is simply the ratio of the density of a substance to the density of water. Essentially, you are comparing it, it being the density of a substance, to the density of water. Now, water is chosen because water is a common substance and it should be available almost everywhere, almost. Now, the value obtained from comparing the two densities has significance. If an object is less dense than water, this ratio will lead, or yield rather, a value that is less than one. That would imply that the object will float because it is less dense, it will float. If this ratio is greater than one, it would imply that the object is far more dense than water and therefore it will sink. So stone, metal, some types of wood, um, they have densities that are greater than that of water and they sink. Um, foam, cork, styrofoam, all have densities significantly less than water and they float. In today's lab, we will be looking at density. We will show you how to use the immersion method to find the density of an irregular solid. Now, if a solid is regular in shape, as in you can measure its dimensions, its height, its length, its width, you can measure those, record them, and you can calculate its volume. You can take that same regular object, put it on a scale, and you can find its mass by calculating volume from measurements. And by measuring mass, you can find its density. But for objects that are irregular in shape, like stones, um, chunks of Play-Doh, and even other objects that might be a bit too um, uneven to be measured, you can use the immersion method to find their density. And that is what we will now do today. Now, the star of today's show is our Play-Doh, our little, well, not so little lump of Play-Doh, blue, my favorite color. The second star of today's show is our string, eh, not the prettiest uh, 
set of string you'd find, but effective nonetheless. Third, and the one thing we have to be really gentle with, is our very large measuring cylinder. Now, we chose a measuring cylinder this big because one, the, the numbers are pretty large and it's easy to see, and so are the divisions. And finally, the big boy, our scale. Now, do forgive the clanging sound. This is a triple beam balance, and how does it work for those of you at home? It's, it's very simple. You put your mass here, it displaces this arm, as you can see. I press down, the arm goes up, and I simply adjust the masses along the arm to the point at which the little mark on the vertical column and the horizontal arm line up. And whatever the combined mass readings from these three beams are, that is our mass or the mass of the object that is on the pan. Let us now begin. Now, the first thing we have to do is find the mass of our little lump of Play-Doh. And we use our balance. We gently place our mass onto the balance. Please don't drop it. Gently. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy lump of Play-Doh. And we now adjust our sliders until we balance the beam so it's less than 500 grams less than 400 less than three well less than two less than one all right i use the larger scale first so let me start at 90 it's less than 90 Definitely less than 80, but it is greater than 70. Now, once we figure out the range of values in which we find our mass, we do a little playing around and we should obtain a fairly accurate value. Now, for those of you who have electronic scales, that is just perfect. It makes life so much simpler. These manual scales require some patience and concentration. I am almost there. Almost. And by George, I think I have got it. Our mass is 73.4 grams. 73.4 grams. Because there is 70 on this scale, and there is 3.4 on that scale. So when you add up the masses on the two scales, our back scale and the scale in front, we get 73.4 grams and that is roughly the mass of our lump of play-doh now this is our measuring cylinder as i said earlier we chose a very large measuring measuring cylinder with large numbers so that it'd be easily seen and large divisions that would also be easily seen now how do we use this well we fill it up to a suitable volume now a suitable volume would be somewhere around half of its capacity for two reasons. One, we don't want it too full, so that when we lower the lump of Play-Doh into the measuring cylinder, the water runs out of the measuring cylinder, and we don't want it to be um, too empty, so that when we do put our lump of Play-Doh into the measuring cylinder, it's not fully submerged. The object, when placed into the measuring cylinder, has to be fully submerged. So we will go for half of our measuring cylinder, and then we will lower our Play-Doh into it. That's it. Right. What I now have to do is read the water level 
and this must be done at eye level so I will actually have to lower my gaze so that it is parallel with the level of the water and I will read the bottom of the meniscus which is the slight curvature of the water surface and that would tell me where my water level is as you can see uh, 50 100 150 200 250 we are going for around 250 milliliters or cubic centimeters of water so reading it at eye level it is slightly above 250 cubic centimeters of water um, I will have to be very very careful in what I now do because I have to throw away only a small amount and I think I probably overdid it I did not overdo it it is accurate that is exactly 250 cubic centimeters of water goal accomplished so with my 250 cubic centimeters of water in my very tall measuring cylinder I will now lower my lump of play-doh in with the aid of a piece of string time to go tying ready when you are good now here we have our string now we need a length of string that is long enough to allow us to tie our lump of play-doh to the bottom and gently lower it into our measuring cylinder so we just estimate average a rough amount and I don't have a scissors available at the moment and the string isn't really strong enough to need a scissors and I simply make a little noose and I'm now ready to attach the string to my play-doh now please note this is play-doh like soft squishy play-doh I am not trying to cut the play-doh in half with the string I'm just trying to attach the string or tie the play-doh sorry tie the string rather around the play-doh so that I can lower the play-doh into the measuring cylinder that that's all I'm trying to do nothing else so with my little noose all I do is make it small enough to get oh no aha uh -huh. yes here it is and voila string safely fastened to play-doh nothing complicated no rocket science now all that will happen is we will gently lower it please don't drop you gently lower to avoid splashing and also in the case of much heavier objects or even if the objects are the same mass as this play-doh objects that can chip or break glass you still lower it just to be safe now, with our numbers facing you, the audience, I will gently lower my lump of Play-Doh, which has now discolored my hands, into the measuring cylinder. You will observe that as the lump is lowered into the cylinder, there is a change in the level of the water. Now, I can actually lower this all the way down to the bottom, and I can actually let it rest there so I don't have to constantly hold it because I don't want to shake or move the lump of play-doh and cause the water level to wobble now with the play-doh in the measuring cylinder I now record the change in the level of water you clearly saw it rise and just let me take it out again to show you water level goes down with play-doh out and as I lower it observe the water level rises now we have successfully lowered our little lump of play-doh into our measuring cylinder and our water level was previously at 250 cubic centimeters and it is now much closer to 300 each division let me just turn this for ever so slightly each of these divisions is five cubic centimeters so this should be 275 this is 300 according to the scale this is somewhere between 300 cubic centimeters and 295 cubic centimeters if we split the difference it would be at 297.5 
cubic centimeters. So our volume before we lowered it was 250. Our volume after we lowered it was 297.5. That makes the volume of our lump of Play-Doh 4 to 7.5 cubic centimeters. 4 to 7.5 cubic centimeters. Now, having completed our experiment or ha having done the actual experiment, we obtain three bits of information. The first is our mass. Our mass was 73.4 grams. Um, nothing fancy or complicated about that. We have two values of volume. Before, we lowered our lump of Play-Doh into the measuring cylinder and then an approximate value for our volume after. Now, this is all the data we collected and this would be what we call our results. Moving on to our calculations. The first thing we have to calculate is the actual volume of our mass. And that volume is simply the difference between these two values, okay? So, to write it down, we just put 297.5 minus 250, and we end up with 47.5 cubic centimeters. And this is our volume. The second thing we have to now do is find our density. And our density is equal to our mass, 7 to 3.4, divided by 4 to 7.5 cubic centimeters. That is, our density is equal to 7 to 3.4 grams, divided by 4 to 7.5 cm cubed. And this gives us 1.545 grams per cm cubed. 1.545. If you're desirous of rounding off, 1.55 grams per cm cubed. And this is our density. Having found our density as 1.55 grams per cm cubed, we are now required to find our relative density. Our relative density is not that difficult to find, but we still need to take our time with it. It is the density of our object, which is 1.55 grams per cm cubed, divided by the density of water. The density of water is given as one gram per cm cubed. This works out to 1.55. What I would like you to note is that there are no units here. That is because relative density is what we call dimensionless. It has no units. It is one of a few quantities in physics that does not have any units. So relative density, dimensionless. And in this case, the relative density of our lump of Play-Doh is 1.55. Now this makes sense because our lump of Play-Doh did not float, it actually sank. And since this value is greater than one, it would indicate that whatever object we were looking at would not float in water but would sink, as it did. So once again, to recap, our density is 1.55 grams per cm cubed and our relative density is simply 1.55. Now we have done a lab and a lesson. And we have given you a few formulae, given you a few terms. But it's time for us to apply what we know to a simple question. Here goes. A small block of wood of length 3cm and width 4 cm and height 2 cm has a mass of let us say 
120 grams. 120 grams. Find one, its weight, two, its volume, three, its density, and four, its relative density. So, the first thing we have been asked is weight. How do we do this? We write our formula down. W is equal to M times G. Now, our mass has been given as 120 grams. But as we learned today, mass is actually measured in kilograms. So to convert our 120 grams to kilograms, we just divide by 1,000. 120 divided by 1,000. And for simplicity's sake, we will use acceleration due to gravity as 10. Now, if we multiply, what we end up with is 1,200 over 1,000. And this gives us 1.2 Newtons. 1.2 Newtons is our weight. Mass in kilograms by acceleration due to gravity in meters per second squared. So we can check this off. Weight found. Volume. This is a regular object because it has a length, it has a width, and it has a height. So our volume is length by width by height. Our length is 3, our width is 4, our height is 2. 3 4s are 12, and 2 12s are 24 cm cube or 24 cubic centimeters. And this is our volume. We can check that off the list. Density. Now, density is represented by a symbol you did see earlier, but I did not explain. It's called, it's a Greek letter called rho. And density is mass over volume, m over v. Mass is 120 grams. Volume is 24 cm cube. And this is 5 grams per cm cube. So we can check density off our list. And finally, relative density. Relative density is density of substance over density of water. Density of a substance is five grams per cm cube. Water is one gram per cm cube. And therefore our relative density is five meaning that this object will definitely sink in water. So, simple problem, simple solution. Thank you.